Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, the chair of the department. Thanks uh, to all of you for joining us. Uh, this is a, another in our long series now of COVID Grand Rounds. Next week, we'll get back to non-COVID topics. Uh, we'll be in conversation with our own Kirsten Bibbins Domingo, our, uh, still on our faculty, uh, just past chief of uh, uh, Epi and Biostat Department, and now the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, today, we're going to talk about an update in COVID. There's a lot going on with uh, boosters and the current state of the pandemic and, and, uh, and information about antivirals and, uh, and all sorts of policy issues. Uh, we thought the, a nice way to focus on this was to uh, recognize that last week was the annual meeting of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, where uh, uh, most of the specialists in ID come together to talk about latest advances and a lot of the topic a lot of the focus was on the current state of COVID, so we thought that would be a nice focus for today. So we have three preeminent speakers to talk about their impressions of the meeting and the take home messages from, uh, from that meeting. Uh, two of them are from UCSF and one is one of our uh, favorite outside visitors to Grand Rounds. Uh, that is uh, Carlos Del Rio, who's professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at Emory and professor of global health and EPI at the Rollins School of Public Health. And this week, he became the president of the IDSA, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, which is the preeminent professional society for ID practitioners with, I think, about 12,000 members. So, Carlos, congratulations, and thank you for taking the time uh, to Happy visit to be us with you. today. Uh, and Carlos, in his career, has focused on diagnosis, access, engagement, compliance with antiretrovirals, mostly in the context of HIV infection, but like many such people has pivoted to focusing on COVID and has been a really important voice in both the public and professional uh, space over the past three years. Uh, Carlos has authored over 350 scientific articles, 30 book chapters, and he's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and in fact is the foreign secretary for the NAM. So uh, Carlos will go first. Second uh, will be Lisa Winston, who's professor of medicine in our division of HIV, infectious diseases and global medicine at uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Lisa is also hospital epidemiologist at ZSFG, uh, chief of the medical staff of, at, at the hospital, and she is a Department of Medicine master clinician. Uh, and so, uh, and Lisa uh, is an active clinician educator, and her research interests are in infection control and prevention. Uh, and like all of us, has focused a lot of her attention over the last three years uh, on COVID, not only in her role as an ID doctor, but hospital epidemiologist and chief of the medical staff. So Lisa, thank you for being here. Thank you, Bob. And, and our third guest will be Monica Gandhi, well known to this forum. Monica's professor of medicine, associate chief of the division of HIV, ID and global medicine, also at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Uh, Monica also directs the UCS of Gladstone Center for AIDS Research and is medical director of the HIV clinic, uh, uh, known as Ward 86 at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Uh, Monica's research is uh, very wide ranging. Uh, she's focused a lot on low cost solutions to uh, treating people with HIV. Uh, she's also focused on pre-exposure prophylaxis and other treatment strategies. And during uh, COVID, she's also been an, an important voice both in public uh, and professional settings, uh, looking at non-pharmacological interventions, vaccines, boosters, and the like. And, uh, and she has a book coming out uh, from the Mayo Clinic Press entitled uh, Endemic Lessons from HIV, from HIV for COVID-19, and it will come out sometime next year. So Monica, thank you for being here. And uh, let's start with Carlos. And uh, maybe Carlos, you can pop back on. And uh, we'll start open-ended. So Carlos, tell us a little bit about your impressions from uh, from the uh, the IDSA meeting and kind of what what the overall vibe was and some take home messages from what you saw some of the key research. Well, thank you, Bob. I think uh, you know we hadn't had ID week since 2019. That was the last time we met in person. 2020, 2021, we went virtual. This was the first in person meeting. It is ironic that it was also in DC where we had the 2019 meeting. Uh, you know, we had about about 9,000 people. Uh, live in person. There are another 2,000 people virtually, so it was a hybrid meeting. And uh, I would say of the 9,000 people that were there, the feeling was of, of everybody was happy, everybody was satisfied, everybody was uh, thrilled to see friends, to see colleagues, to be able to, to be with each other. You know, it's uh, everybody was vaccinated. You had to show proof of vaccination. 
everybody was a mask except when they spoke. But but of course, then everybody went out for dinner and everybody went to to parties and everybody went to other places where you weren't masked. So it's a little interesting to see this dichotomy, right? And you can argue, well, you know, you're masked when you're sitting with a bunch of people and you try not to be masked when you are moving and maybe in an outdoor restaurant eating. But, it, you know, it's it's uh, I would love to see if we can get some data of if people get infected or not. But, you know, thank God right now there's not a lot of COVID transmission happening. So so hopefully we avoided being a super spread event. And, you know, the fact is that people's immunity is better and while not ideal, I think we're in a better place. There was a lot of COVID discussion at the meeting. Uh, I think we started with an opening plenary that I would say that drew some controversy. There were some people that weren't happy with having, you know, uh, uh, Emily Oster and David Lenhard as two of the speakers. And we had also invited uh, Mug Sevic, but Mug unfortunately was not able to make it because of personal reasons. So I had to step in at the last minute to be uh, one of the speakers. And we also had a, a an expert in crisis communication uh, in the, in, uh, as a speaker, uh, Dr. Howrich. And, uh, you know, I would say it was a really good discussion about how difficult communication has been during the pandemic and how complicated it has been uh, and how what the challenges and, and what the limitations have been. But I thought it was a very well-received uh, plenary, and I thought people were very happy with the discussion. I think all of us as infectious disease doctors, if we learn something, is we need one of the competencies we need is to be trained on how to communicate with people, how to communicate with, with non-scientific audiences. How do we get our message across in a way that is effective? And how do you do that in an evolving pandemic where things, what we what we know tomorrow is not what we know today, yet we have to make some decisions and have to say, give, give our best advice today. And that has been hard. There were some interesting presentations related to to antivirals. We we got to see the, the data on Active6 and, and this is the, you know, an NIH funded, uh, a multi-intervention trial, and we got to see the data on ivermectin. This was a well-done randomized trial, and it was nice to see the data being presented. And within, you know, ten minutes, the 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 article actually appearing in the JAMA website. So we were able to see the abstract presented and the and the abstract and the article appearing in JAMA, right? Literally coordinated with that, and that was that was really nice. We also saw some presentations on long COVID risk for severe infection, risk for transmission. Uh, and and we saw some data on on, on vaccines and uh, and vaccine uh, you know the efficacy and the, the immunogenicity of boosters. So overall, I thought uh, a lot of a lot of uh, good science, a lot of good discussion. I think the meeting ended with a wonderful plenary. A lot of focus on the meeting was on health equity. And the last the closing session of the meeting, which unfortunately, you know, by that time maybe there were no more than three hundred people in the room as opposed to thousands. I think it was one of the best closing plenaries I've seen. And I would encourage people to try to see it. I'm going to try to see if IDSA can make it available to people, you know, without having been registered to the meeting. It was just superb plenary talking about how we in infectious disease are sitting in our office, in our in our in our in our clinics at the center of, of making health equity a reality. What kinds of things we can do to really address health equity? Because as as we have all discussed, and we need to say it over and over, you know, pandemics affect the most the, the vulnerable in this proportion more than anybody else. We are not in this all the same. And, and we need to realize that and we need to address health equity and structural racism as keys in our pandemic preparedness into the future. Over. Great. Thank you, Carlos. Um, when I, I get to a couple of studies in a second, but when people went out to dinner, so these are the leading infectious disease doctors in the, in the, in the country, in the world, uh, and we're sitting at dinner or sitting at a bar, was the topic of discussion, is this the right thing to do, or just everybody accepted that, you know, this, this, this makes, this doesn't create too much cognitive dissonance that I'm sitting in the lecture hall wearing my mask, but I'm going out to dinner in a closed indoor space without a mask. Well, so the, I would say the highest risk dinner that I had was a dinner that, uh, that uh, my division, uh, division chief, uh, Monica Farley, Wendy Armstrong and I organized for the fellows to, just with about some faculties, about 30 people at the dinner. And what we did is, you know, I, I carried with me a, a suitcase full of rapid tests and mm -hmm. everybody going to the dinner was giving a, 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 a two, two rapid tests, one to be done on the day before and one to be done right at the meeting. So we, we did that as, a, as an additional strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we thought it was a high risk enough activity that I think rapid testing needed to be incorporated into it. And we didn't want this dinner, which was in a, in a close environment with not a lot of good, you know, uh, uh, airflow to be, become a multi, uh, multi, you know, super spreader event. 
Yeah. Uh, other dinners that I went to were mostly outside, but you know, there is there was a sense of of I would say, gee, you know, what am I doing? And should I be outside? Should I not be? But at some point, I think everybody's saying, look, we believe in the science. Uh, vaccines protect you from severe disease. And if we get infected, you know, you'll get infected, but you're not going to die. We're all vaccinated. We're all boosted. And and we we are really enjoying the science. And it's time to, I think, as we go on to our normal lives, our lives are not yet normal, but it's it's toward uh, the route to normalcy. It may include a lot of things like masking, like, you know, vaccination. And and why not testing? As I said, I carried myself with my with me, literally a suitcase, a rapid test, so we can wow. have the dinner with our fellows. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine it would have been a little. I, were, I, were you prepared to if there was a super spreader event, and you're now the president of IDSA to get in front of the national press to to talk that through? I have been fearing that, and and hopefully yeah, that's that, not I, the case. But I have been really I, worried about that. Let's we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, that's that would be tricky. Uh, just a couple of quick. So you mentioned the ivermectin study. For those that didn't see it, can you just give a one liner what the results were. Well, it's a very good uh, randomized controlled trial in which they tested ivermectin in outpatients with, with 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 COVID and basically showed what we have known. But now it's it's, it's published and it's a nice randomized trial. It's a well done study showing that it doesn't work. It doesn't decrease symptoms. It doesn't improve time to to improve no symptoms. It doesn't get you better sooner. So ivermectin has no role in COVID. And, you know, we want to be sure that this is published because we really need to stop politicians telling clinicians what to do. I and mean, we've seen too many, you know, judges mandate the use of ivermectin and we need to stop doing the, the wrong things and we need to start doing the right things. We yeah. also saw a very interesting study on, on a follow-up on the, on the Paxlovid study, on the you know, Paravir, Ritonavir study in outpatient settings, showing that it may actually decrease the duration of symptoms. And again, it's it's encouraging, but the data needs to still be uh, looked in peer review. Any anything on Paxlovid to rebound? Um, there was actually very little on on on, on rebound that I saw that I was really the uh, uh, you know new or eye opening. Mm -hmm. Okay, well we'll get you mentioned other things along COVID. You mentioned the role of boosters and and uh, and whether the new one is working any better. We'll get back to that, I'm sure, after the other uh, after the other speakers uh, come in. So let's go ahead and bring Lisa in and. Uh, Lisa, go ahead and uh, talk through kind of your impressions of the meeting and, you know, both overall zeitgeist and then some of the research that you saw that was helpful in your thinking about COVID. Yeah, great. great. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, so very much um, uh, agree, not surprisingly, with uh, Dr. Del Rio about the uh, general zeitgeist. Um, and uh, uh, I th I'm sure many people follow, but uh, for those who are interested, um, Dr. Paul Sachs has a, you know, really nice blog um, talking about the cognitive dissonance about, um, uh, you know, wearing the masks at the meeting and then uh, going out without masks. Um, you know, I, I think perhaps not surprisingly, given uh, the nature of the attendees, uh, people were very attentive to the, their mask wearing, you know, at the meeting, not an issue. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I do not know if this is the case at uh, many meetings, but uh, amongst the um, swag that uh, you could get as an attendee, you know, including your um, pens and whatnot, um, were some very nice uh, KN95 masks that said uh, ID Week on them. Um, they were very popular and, uh, and many people were wearing them during the meeting. Um, I, I do think people were really thrilled to be back together in person, um, seeing lots of people that, you know, we hadn't seen um, for several years and, uh, and just reconnecting. Um, so, you know, I think in that sense, the, you know, in addition to really great uh, sessions, um, people were very, very excited to be there and in person. You know, in terms of some of the um, science and the highlights with respect to what was presented on COVID, um, there were a number of really nice sessions. And, you know, just briefly to talk about a few of them, um, there was a, a really well done session on evidence based SARS CoV 2 prevention um, that, you know, kind of came, you came away for with two 
take home messages, I think, from that. Uh, one is that, you know, it's still pretty unclear after all this time uh, how to best determine when someone is no longer infectious. Um, so really work through kind of the data on, um, you know, challenges with the tests that we have and, um, you know, uh, or whether time-based strategies are preferable. And I think that's something, you know, as the CDC is updating their guidance and many health departments are updating their guidance that, you know, people um, have have interest in. So that was a that was a very good review. And, and I think the other part of that session that was really nice, um, one of the implementation scientists talked about, and I, you know, I think this is really obvious, but it may be underappreciated by most of us, but just talking about, you know, even though we have prevention strategies that we know work, um, they're really only going to have efficacy if they're both acceptable and sustainable. Um, so for example, you know, things like um, mask mandates and, uh, and how we should think about that going forward. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, some of the uh, sort of more traditional science, um, Dr. Del Rio talked about the, uh, the active six studies that were presented. Um, and, you know, I was disappointed. It would be nice if our repurposed outpatient therapies um, did have some efficacy because, you know, they're available and generally inexpensive. Um, but in addition to ivermectin not being effective, um, there really isn't significant clinical benefit either with fluticasone or fluvoxamine, um, both of which, you know, have been talked about now for quite a while. Um, there were some really promising studies um, for hospitalized patients. Um, uh, including, you know, one that I think got a bit of buzz, uh, sabazabulin is a uh, novel oral micro microtubule disruptor, um, and uh, which was studied in actually quite a small study in moderate in patients with moderate severe COVID who were on O2 um, and showed a 55% decrease in mortality. Um, I think most of us who were sitting there, you know, there was a lot of kind of, um, uh, talk in between the presentations, I, I think we all sort of feel like that might be too good to be true, um, needs uh, verification and a larger study. Um, but, um, but we also heard about um, uh, Vilobelumab, uh, an anti-C5A um, uh, drug that had a mortality benefit. And then in terms of the active one studies, um, both in fliximab and abetacept, um, when they were added to um, standard of care, showed uh, decreased mortality in uh, hospitalized patients. Um, in the same session um, uh, with some of those uh, drugs, we also heard about inhaled interferon beta, which is, you know, an interesting concept. Um, and although it failed to meet its primary effectiveness endpoints, um, so it didn't change um, time to discharge or recovery um, for hospitalized patients, um, there was an intriguing signal of possible decreased risk of long COVID symptoms. Um, in people who were treated. Um, so we look forward to hearing more about that. And then the last thing that I'll just mention, because uh, I think Dr. Gandhi is going to, um, you know, talk about some of the things at the, uh, at the meeting that were not related um, to COVID. Um, lots of good things. But, you know, uh, 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 Bob, as you know, I love vaccines. And there are no fewer than four RSV vaccines um, in clinical trials in people, either um, phase two or phase three studies um, that look really promising, um, both for uh, older adults pre preventing, a, um, uh, preventing RSV, um, but also um, one of the uh, same vaccines was pre uh, presented showing um, uh, in a phase 2B trial in pregnant women, um, looking at, um, you know, uh, outcomes for infants, um, which was also a positive study in terms of transfer of immunity. So, um, so some, some really, some really good stuff on the non-COVID front as well. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Did the so, so, so Bob, yeah, go ahead, Bob, if, I, if, I, if I can add something to what Lisa said, sure. you know, the sub, the sub is, uh, the sub is solidly, sub is uh, treatment study, if people want to look at it, it was actually published in this thing called New Evidence New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, 
to me the, and to all of us that were sitting there, what was really striking mm -hmm. is yet the study, yes, the drug use showed a decrease in mortality, but the mortality rate was 20% for the ones that got the drug and 45% for those that got placebo. And all of us were saying, wait a second, mortality of COVID is not 45%. No. So, you know, something just doesn't make any sense. And that to me is, is my biggest concern is, is, is something is wrong with that study. And I'm, I'm really surprised that this, this publication, England Journal of Medicine Evidence actually actually published this and, and made it a, as an article, because quite frankly, I, I, I really have my serious doubt about it. Was this in, was it just ICU patients or would it, it's an extraordinarily high mortality rate, even if it were ICU patients? Yeah, yeah. It, not, not, so uh, that's a fantastic point. Thank you for um, uh, making it. Uh, not in fact, um, mostly ICU patients. Um, oh. th these were patients who required oxygen, um, but, uh, but many patients only with moderate disease. So, uh, so really appreciate Dr. Del Rio, uh, making that point. Um, yeah. There's sort of a Bayesian aspect to hearing a trial and you just, it just does not pass the face validity test and you have to look at it pretty skeptically. I, at least on the RSV front, I, you know, don't know that much about RSV and now it's in the press a lot. It's this triple pandemic with, with flu and RSV. Um, the fact that there's all this stuff coming out in vaccines for RSV, is that a consequence of COVID? Or is that sort of, it just happened to be that the RSV vaccine world reached its tipping point this year? Yeah, um, well, there has definitely been more interest, but but as you know, you know, these, uh, these studies take a long time. And so, um, you know, and, and, and we've been seeing uh, a variety of things um, with RSV uh, vaccines building over the last few years. So I think it's more coincidental that, um, you know, we happen to be seeing them come to fruition um, at, at this time. Um, but certainly lots of interest in respiratory diseases and vaccines that have been um, kindled throughout the uh, the pandemic. So, um, sure. but yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll get back to you as well for more questions about all of this, but let's go on to Monica. And I think Monica's going to present a few items from uh, regarding COVID and maybe some of the blockbusters outside of COVID that came through at the meeting. So Monica, if you can pop on, that'd be great. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah. So I will actually share just a couple of slides because I think, um, I think what Lisa was just talking about is kind of the question that you're getting to, uh, Bob, which is what about masks? What about trust in public health? What about mitigation measures? What did we talk about? Did we talk about the evidence for them and implementation science? And it was a tremendously important meeting to talk about public health communications, how in a way it is up to us in ID to bring back some of the trust in public health. Um, we are pretty worried about some of the loss of um, the trust in vaccines uh, where there was a polio session that was, I can't believe we're talking about bringing back oral polio vaccine here in the United States. There was a lot of concern about what the pandemic did in terms of trust and, um, and our ability to communications because we are going to have more pandemics and vaccines are going to be key to pandemics. And so that means we have to, um, people need to want to take vaccines. So in reference to the session that Lisa just told you about, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, and this was really important, we had nothing else we could do. We, we had this timeline that was so scary um, at the beginning of January, the cruise ships in March of 2020, and then we had tests by May. And of course, we were going to put in any mitigation procedure that we could any anything of. We thought about mass mandates. We put in testing programs. We limited gatherings. We stopped. We closed businesses. Um, and um, we did things or thought about ventilation. And this was important because there was nothing else that we could do. And then we got vaccines. And as you see, just in the concept of implementation science, asking people to change their lives, to close their businesses, to wear masks, to not look at each other, to all of that, is you're going to get what's called program drift. And you're going to get the lack of compliance because people get tired. And um, even in the Bangladesh mask study, which is the most definitive study of a randomized controlled study of looking at mask effectiveness versus not in a population RCT, it basically didn't show high levels of effectiveness of masking 
not maybe because of the mask, but because of the ability to wear them and the tiredness of, of, uh, of wearing them. And so I thought this was a really nice summary slide. Oh, and importantly, if you look at mask mandates versus no mask mandates during the Omicron surge, which is this is post vaccine, this was uh, published across multiple states, data from the CDC, there was actually no difference in places like California, in cases that went up and case, how cases went down, and places that didn't have mask mandates post vaccine, because people I think trusted the vaccine and I think they weren't wearing masks. And we have had all this incredible progress in COVID-19 therapeutics at the beginning for hospitalized patients, all of the vaccines, and then our antiviral treatments, including our monoclonal antibodies. And we did talk a little bit about molnupiravir and how maybe it doesn't look like it works as well in vaccinated patients, but let's please remember that the panoramic study, mostly people were under 65 who is still at risk for severe COVID, it's older patients, it's patients on immunosuppression, it's patients with renal disease, and it's patients um, who have multiple comorbidities. That's what a huge UK Lancet study showed us um, of 30 million people. Those are people who are still at risk, who need boosting, who need antivirals. And so think about older antivirals, even molnupiravir in older patients. And so this study, this uh, session, which was on preventing COVID-19, ended with this kind of um, summary slide of what we should be doing at this point in terms of non-pharmaceutical interventions. And masking mandates, and I think the country has gone to this, should shift to individual choice. But if we are going to mask, then wear the right mask. Then wear a KF94 and an, uh, K95 and N95 or an FFP2. By telling people we should wear cloth masks, I think that we did reduce trust in public health. Testing programs should be based on the community risk level and social distancing, closing businesses should be avoiding, avoided now. We have the tools, uh, as Carlos said, we have vaccines, we have therapeutics. Ventilation is a very high impact intervention that we should be thinking about a lot because it will help us with all of our respiratory pathogens and then tailor our boosting messaging and We'll talk later about monoclonal antibodies and what we can use for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I thought it was a really nice session that the context has changed with mitigation. The context has changed with masking. And yes, people were out and we had our UCSF event and I will just say, we did not test, we did not mask and it was pretty crowded. Um, I'll just add a couple more things. Um, so um, we, the, the, the reason that we talked a lot about communication at this meeting, and I really appreciated uh, the, the first session with Emily Oster and David Leonard, who have been at various times um, said things that maybe people didn't want to hear about school openings, but, um, but uh, I think we're at a point in the pandemic where we saw the damage of, of school closures in terms of learning losses. Um, but the reason it's important to regain that trust to have a setting in which we regain trust. People don't like to, um, to not be together <laughs> for Christmas, uh, for their holidays. It, it's important to regain trust is because we talked a lot about climate change. And this was a very important paper in a journal that I didn't actually know existed called Nature Climate Change, which we discussed at the meeting, which is that over half of our known pathogenic diseases can actually be aggravated by climate change. Climate change is not just in terms of heat related illnesses, which there was another nature paper about heat related deaths, but the pathogens moving into climes that are cooler because they have to get away from our warming planet. And that means we will see more pandemics. And the solution to pandemics is vaccines. And that means we have to increase trust in public health so that people will take vaccines. And then I think one very big focus of the meeting was antimicrobial resistance. And this was something that got lost a little bit during the pandemic, but you can see just three months before the pandemic in October, 2019, there was a warning that Antimicrobial resistance in this country is the fourth leading cause of death. It is actually the leading cause of infectious disease death prior to the COVID pandemic after heart disease, cancer, and accidents. And this was also a paper that actually appeared in January 2022 in Lancet, but it also lost some attention because of COVID. But the global burden of bacterial antimicrobial resistance is enormous. And if you think about 
COVID, HIV, malaria, TB, antimicrobial resistance is right up there as a leading cause of infectious disease death. And antimicrobial use increased during the COVID pandemic because people always throw antibiotics at ill patients. And because of this, there was a lot of attention paid at this meeting to bringing it back, to stopping our use, our flagrant use of antibiotics. And this was a very nice study. These are kind of clinical trials that change clinical practice. Um, but this is a study that was in JAMA that looks at, in the context of ventilator-associated pneumonia, gram stain um, mediated uh, reduction of use of antibiotics, meaning doing an endotracheal aspirate importantly, so we need our critical care colleagues, and looking at a gram stain of what's in there, and then reducing antibiotics, tailoring them, narrowing them just to that bug alone. And that actually re um, led to the same clinical outcomes as broad spectrum, but better antimicrobial stewardship. So that was one important antimicrobial um, resistance uh, reduction paper presented at the meeting in these clinical trials that will change your practice. Another important one, it's sort of along the lines of reducing use, but it's also along the lines of simplifying care, is Staph aureus bacteremia in the hospital. We always used to just use IV antibiotics, but we're increasingly thinking in non-complicated Staph aureus, where you don't have a catheter in, where you don't have Staph in multiple places, just the plain bacteremia and you're not immunosuppressed, can we quickly go over to an oral regimen? You can get someone out of the hospital quite quickly. And the regimen in this case is trimethoprim sulfa. Um, I think it was underdosed actually, but, um, and, and just putting someone on oral therapy for yes, staph, uncomplicated staph aureus bacteremia, getting them out of the hospital. And absolutely it optimized people getting out of the hospital and no increased rate of recurrence of bacteremia. So I think this was really eye-opening in terms of bacterial care. A um, couple more things. Again, these are changing. These are like absolutely clinical practice changing in our field. Uh, in tuberculosis, um, I will just actually mention the idea of shortening courses. Shortening courses, um, already the WHO guidelines as of May 2022 has talked about, let's shorten our courses from six months to four months. We have an adult regimen that's not what we call the right. We call it right because it's rifampin, isoniazid, and ethambutol. But this was a study in children that can you take drug susceptible TB and that six month course make it four months and children did just as well. So the WHO guidelines have now changed to treatment shortening for TB. This is revolutionary because we always treated TB for so long. So please keep that in mind as well. Um, just two more things to say, one on viruses and one on fungi. In terms of viruses, I think the biggest uh, kind of one big story of the year was, was performed right here at UCSF. This is the ANCHOR study. And this is a study of anal cancer. And what can you do about, why, do, why is this related to viruses? Because human, human papillomavirus is the etiologic agent of anal cancer. And we know that people with HIV really are at risk for getting um, high grade with uh, squamous intraepithelial lesions and then anal cancer. But the question, has been, well, does it, does treatment, early treatment matter, electrocautery, uh, burning off those dysplastic lesions, does that reduce the risk of eventual anal cancer? And this was published in the New England Journal. It was a very big deal that we had to talk about at ID Week that yes, doing early treatment for high grade lesions. Uh, this Joel Pilevsky, so here, ID physician here at UCSF uh, led this study, treating early will reduce anal cancer by 60%. And the reason this is such a big deal is we all in our ID clinics all around the country, but um, it's for example, very specially over on our HIV clinic at Ward 86 here at San Francisco General, we have to be doing anal cops and, and we need more colposcopists and we need to treat before we get to anal cancer. Big story in hepatitis D, we don't screen for it enough. Remember what hepatitis D is, it's that form of, um, it's, a, it's a virus that makes hepatitis B worse. Why would we even care about it? Because a treatment is coming. So Bulaveritide is a hepatitis D virus entry inhibitor. This was presented as a very groundbreaking study because we're gonna be able to treat it with a sub-Q injection every day. So you need to remember and think about hepatitis D to eventually use this treatment. This is not yet approved here. It's gonna be on the docket at the FDA. 
before the end of the year, and it has been approved in Europe for treatment of hepatitis D. And then the final thing I'll say is in the world of fungi. I remember when I first came here as a resident, we used to go over to Harry Hollander's house, our residency program director, and present big papers. And the big paper in 1996, because that was when I was an intern here, was amphotericin B and 5-FC for two weeks as induction therapy for cryptococcal meningitis before you change them over to oral fluconazole. Two weeks has been the standard of care for induction therapy. But Shockingly, we probably could just do one dose of Ampho B um, for induction therapy for cryptococcal meningitis. And so already it's changed to one week in resource limited settings of Ampho B and 5FC's induction for cryptococcus prior to going to oral therapy. And then this was a study published in the New England Journal, got a lot of attention at ID Week, that just one dose of Ampho B and then you switch over to oral fluconazole was non inferior to giving a whole week of Ampho B induction. No IV, um, not all those side effects, and much easier in resource limited settings. And we will be talking next week here at um, our hospital about whether we're gonna adopt these guidelines. So I'll end there, um, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Monica. That was terrific and actually useful to hear that all of ID is not COVID. <laughs> There's plenty of cool stuff going on in the other fields. Let's bring everybody else back on. And in the remainder of our time, I, I think I'm mostly going to stick to the COVID uh, studies and, and don't feel the need to stick to the meeting is sort of more kind of what you think the state of the art is. And I'm just going to throw out a bunch of big issues that everybody's grappling with. So now the new booster has been out for a month and a half or so. Um, do we know anything more about how well it works, how long it will work for, how uh, whether it is advantageous compared to the old booster in terms of preventing infection or preventing severe infection? Any of you want to take so two, or, two, Go two, ahead, Carlos. Two, two studies in preprint right now, one from David Ho's lab at Columbia, one from Dan Baruch at Harvard, both uh, suggest that the immune response, including the both the, the, the humoral immunity and the T cell and B cell response in one of the studies is, in both studies actually, is no different whether you boost with a, you, the original Wuhan strain monovalent or you boost with the, with the bivalent one that we're using right now. Uh, it's not what the company has told us initially. It's, it's, it looks a little different, but these are two studies again in preprint that we need to, to, to consider. I think the important thing is that, okay, get boosted. I don't care what you use and, you know, just get boosted and but we don't have any data that is going to tell us what is going to be long-term with these boosters. And I think we're making the science as we go. And that's part of the problem, right? I mean, these boosters were approved based on data from eight mice. And we need to remember that. Well, yeah. So, I mean, the question, the question is, 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 did we overpromise? or, I mean, I think what I've always said all along is it's, there's no good reason to think it'd be any worse or less safe than the old booster. And one hopes that it will be better because it's targeted and, you know, all this, uh, you know, rejiggered. So do you think what we're learning is that it probably is no better? And then what is that? Why would it not be better? I guess that seems to me a surprising finding, given that it is built to be targeted against the variant du jour. I mean, I, I would love to hear what Monica yeah. and Lisa and others have to Monica, say. But I think you wanna... immunolo oh. immunological priming is probably a big role. Yeah. yeah. It, it really is. It just comes down to cellular immunity, right? And we, I feel like we, um, maybe the media, or maybe even the, the White House has focused a lot of, on, on antibodies, right? But, mm -hmm. um, but that's the antibodies have to come from somewhere. They have to come from the, the vaccine actually generating B cells and T cells. And then what do B cells do? B cells are the ones that produce the antibodies and any boost or any infection um, actually will prime your B cells to produce neutralizing antibodies. And they're not, they're not gonna go and produce neutralizing antibodies to some old variant. And I mean, even the B cells I got from my original vaccine, say I, I got three mRNA vaccines and say I see BQ11. My B cells, when they say B, BQ11 are not gonna produce antibodies directed against Delta, directed against the ancestral strain. They're gonna adapt their antibodies to just what they see right in front of them. And so um, that's what adaptive immunity means. And so all you need to do is boost. What boosting does is it stimulates the B cells mm -hmm. and you'll produce antibodies to just whatever's in front of you. And so the monovalent vaccine um, will boost your antibodies right up to BA5. 
the directed mRNA vaccine to BA4, BA5 and the ancestral strain will boost it up to BA5. It's just what's in front of you. Um, so I just think it's, we lost kind of sight of adaptive immunity. Actually, Dr. Fauci had given an interview about three months ago after this MCAT study showed there was no difference in giving a bivalent booster versus the monovalent old booster in terms of clinical outcomes. And he said, mm -hmm. we're not gonna need updated boosters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we got them. And maybe we were hoping they'd do something different, but I, I'm not surprised. That so they, is, is, is the lesson going forward that we are not going to need to rejigger the booster? And because at the same time, there's a lot of pressure to come up with better boosters that are, you know, pan coronavirus boosters and nasal vaccines and all. So where does it maybe, Lisa, you want to tackle that? Where, where does this leave us in the world of vaccine development? Because you could look at this result and say, oh, we should just stuck with what we had and maybe stick with it forever. Yeah, well, I, I, I would just, uh, and, and I suspect we would agree, you know, I, I would just be cautious. Um, you know, we, we were talking about this uh, uh, previously, and, you know, I kind of said, well, honestly, I, I've given up guessing. And, <laughs> and it's, you know, we've made a lot of predictions, and it, it, uh, these predictions are being made really in the absence of any clinical data. Um, you know, as has been mentioned, um, and and I think we will start to accrue clinical data. Um, and you know, sometimes we sometimes our assumptions are not right initially, and sometimes it's hard. You know, we've been struggling with this with influenza um, for decades, uh, and and still don't have a great understanding of how to produce the most effective influenza vaccine. Although you know, the science is is moving along. Um, but I, I think it probably is true that the bivalent boosters, um, it, we would not expect them to be um, any less effective than the originals, as you mentioned, Bob. And um, uh, it's been a long time since a lot of people either had COVID or had their last vaccine. Um, so uh, their uh, immunity has likely waned and so these, these, that's what we've got available right now. So, I mean, the bottom line is you should still get boosted if you have not been either infected or vaccinated or boosted in at least several months, whatever the number is. Um, and you're saying in terms of making predictions, we predicted that this BA5 thing would maybe last longer in terms of protection, protection against infection. It turns out maybe not. But are you also saying that the fact that the antibodies don't seem to be any different or better, that we shouldn't be, we sh we're not clear maybe this will last longer or be better in some way. We just don't know yet because we haven't seen clinical trials. Yeah, well, and I mean, and, and it's it's a few different questions, right? So there's the question of longevity of, you know, how long is it going to last? Um, and, and then there's the question of, you know, short-term efficacy, how, how effective is, is it going to be against what's circulating, um, which has a lot of uncertainty in terms of, you know, both how it stimulated our immune responses, but also what viruses are, are actually circulating. So, but my, I, my, my, I said I wasn't going to make predictions. My guess is that um, you'll get protection um, in the short term, um, and particularly protection against uh, severe disease and hospitalization. I, I think I think I agree 100% with Lisa. I think one thing we I've learned in this pandemic, I tell people my three most important words I learned in this pandemic is I don't know, and mm -hmm. I have to say that frequent because otherwise you you, you make a, a mistake. Having said that, you know, I was talking to Ashish Jha uh, about why are we still seeing so many people dying of COVID in our country? And one of the things that it seems pretty clear is that if you're over the age of 60 and you've just been vaccinated and you haven't been boosted, you're probably like somebody who hasn't been vaccinated. And I think we really need to update our knowledge of, of what's fully vaccinated to include being boosted in the last six months mm -hmm. or in the last year. Otherwise, we're really... People think that they're vaccinated and they were vaccinated last year or two years ago, and they're not protected. And I think older populations are really not protected. And I think we really need to think about that population over the age of 60 as one that we really need to target with, with, uh, with, with, with boosting and, uh, and making sure that they're up to date in their vaccinations, because that's the population at risk of dying. And I think between vaccines not being, you know, we're not using enough boosters. We boosted maybe, what, 16 million doses have been given in the country. That's a, that's a smidget of who needs to be vaccinated and who needs to be boosted. And, and, and we have a long way to go. And then you have 
Paxlovid and Malnupiravir not being prescribed enough, I think we're in trouble because we have the tools, but we're not using them. Yeah. One thing uh, I would just think is you mentioned the full virus vaccine. I totally agree with you. Um, I think there was a lot of attention also at ID Week paid to this idea that what is mutating the most is the mm -hmm. particular <laughs> part of the virus that makes it more transmissible, which is the spike protein. That's very, um, very evolutionarily sound with the virus. But um, so uh, it's, there's a lot of mutations along the spike protein. So seeing the entire virus would be helpful. Covaxin is an India product that um, if the trial goes well here, we'll actually have that pretty soon. It's fully enrolled. And then we'll be able to get a booster with the, seeing the entire virus. Very traditional vaccine technology. I think that would be great. Great. Um, any information about, you, you mentioned the, the, the monopiravir, but, but Paxlovid is sort of the main mainstay of treatment for people who get COVID, um, who are at risk. Based on what you heard at the meeting and what you've seen in the last couple of months, are you more or less likely to prescribe it in, let's say, a 65-year-old without special risk factors who gets COVID? Monica, you would, where do you sit on Paxlovid today? Yeah, I mean, um, I completely agree with Carlos and Lisa both. It's really older people, right? These are the people who we have to protect the most. They, this is the residual group that is still very unprotected from COVID, even with vaccines, need boosters, need Paxlovid. So that New England Journal study um, in vaccinated individuals uh, looking at uh, who needs Paxlovid. It really was very well adjusted. I, I, I know there is an epic research study from Israel as well, but that, that didn't adjust for everything. But um, in that New England Journal study that was published, uh, vaccinated people who are over 65 and had comorbidities, the reduction of hospitalization and death was 89%. It's the exact number that the reduction in hospitalization and death was in the original Paxlovid trial mm -hmm. among those who are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. It's terribly important to use Paxlovid in older people who get um, who get COVID. So I would use it in any 65-year-old. And we had an argument kind of back and forth about, well, do they have to have comorbidities or not? And at a certain point, people are like, just just use it. Yeah. You know, we have it. So um, everybody, everybody agree with that? Uh, you know, you hear a lot of docs and patients saying, I don't want to use it because I'm scared to rebound. Carlos, I, you, oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just going to say, I don't, I don't think fear of rebound is a reason uh, not to use it. Um, you know, but we'll look forward to uh, the, there's some new trials of a new protease inhibitor. We can we can see what data we get. Hopefully, we'll get some more data on rebound. Um, but um, you know, I think I think rebound is upsetting when people get it. Don't don't want to minimize that. But um, but people aren't getting hospitalized and aren't getting super sick. And I think that's the goal. So I agree with Monica on the prescription. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think you know if I get a call from a healthy 40-year-old who wants Paxlovid, I try to dissuade them and say there's really no benefit to you. And you may, you know, you may not want it. It's not going to be of any benefit. You'll have the side effects, terrible taste, et cetera. But what upsets also me resistance. is- resistance. I mean, I, I do and, want to add there's some resistance mutations that could come but, up. But what upsets me is, you know, to get a, an email from a from a person that, that works at Emory who says, you know, who well, I don't know, but she said, you know, my parents who live in X place uh, are both over the age of 80. They- uh, they uh, they just that's a positive and their primary care doc says they're not eligible for Paxlovid. Mm -hmm. And I said, can I talk to them? And the reason they said they're not eligible is because they're, they're both taking a statin. And mm -hmm. I think, again, we are not using Paxlovid the way we should. This individual has had to stop the statin, get prescribed Paxlovid, and we'll be fine. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of fear of the drug-drug interactions that can easily be managed. And for that, you know, IDSA try to put something together, one page or saying, this is how you manage drug-drug interactions, because the reality is, it's really easy to manage most of them, and we ought to be able to use the drug in people that need it in a more effective way. And, and the truth is we're not, and that's a problem. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, you mentioned the, the study about isolation guidelines, and uh, you probably are partly responsible for producing them at the county. Uh, where do we stand? You know, does the CDC still say five days and you're good to go, whereas common sense says if your rapid test is still positive, you're not? And are we any closer to in a, a better understanding of that issue? Yeah, well, uh, the public health guidelines, uh, uh, honestly, have only gotten a little more complicated. And, you know, uh, of course, here in California, we use the CDPH guidelines, um, but the CDC recently updated their guidelines um, for healthcare. Um, and, you know, some of it's arbitrary. So now it's, um, you know, for coming back to work in a healthcare setting uh, uh, to wait for seven days. Um, and then, you know, kind of a, um, 
a not totally well explained um, uh, recommendation to actually get two antigen tests um, instead of one, which I think we all think probably makes sense if you might be on the upswing with symptoms and you haven't been diagnosed yet. You know, certainly we've all had experience with people who, you know, have symptoms and their first antigen test is negative, um, but then they have a positive one. But I think really unclear whether that's needed, um, you know, for people who are, uh, who you know have COVID, who are being tested for um uh, to see if they, you know, are still infectious. And actually the, the session that um, uh, Monica and I both mentioned, um, you know, talk, talked a little bit about that. So, uh, you know, I think there is um, a little bit of confusion. Um, and I think the reason that there's some confusion is that there's actually uncertainty um, mm -hmm. about exactly how long. And I think it also depends um, uh, it, you know, if you're coming out of isolation at five days, you know, are you wearing a mask and what kinds of um, settings will you be in? But, it, yeah. you know, just to be clear, um, you know, what we're following right now are the um, California Department of Public Health guidelines. And we'll see how those get updated, you know, with respect to um, the updates the CDC made a few weeks ago. You, you had a friend or family member who was on day eight uh, and still had a rapid test that was positive and said they wanted to come over and hang out with you. What would you tell them? Well, um, and, they feel, and they feel fine. They've been they felt fine for a few days, but yeah. the rapid test is positive. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, in in general, if if, you know, we're not we're not wearing masks, we've been going, you know, everybody's been going with uh, uh, 10 days, um, you know, if you're not masking. And so, you know, I mean, unless there's some urgent reason, um, you know, they need to come over, I think most people would say, I, I, I'll, I'll see you in a couple days, you know, um, let's let's uh, let's talk. Uh, let's talk on the phone. Great. Uh, Carlos, let's turn to you and let's talk long COVID for a second. Uh, any deeper understanding about prevalence, cause, any treatments emerging that seem to work? Where, where do we stand on long, con long COVID? Well, there's there's a lot of, of, of data that's starting to come out on long COVID, some, some better studies than others. There was a, uh, uh, there's a study coming out in JAMA either today or tomorrow. It's a very, very large study suggesting two things. Uh, women are at high risk of long COVID. Women over 40 are at higher risk. The older you get after 40, the more likely you are to get long COVID. I don't know why women and what, I mean, aging makes sense, but I don't know why women would be at higher risk. But the other thing that it does suggest on the positive side is what we all seen, is that between the original strain to, um, to Epsilon, to Omicron, to today, we're seeing the long COVID be less frequent a complication of COVID. So we're seeing less and less prevalence of long COVID. And the other thing that it shows in a pretty good way is that vaccination uh, it really decreases dramatically your risk of long COVID. So I think that that the good news is, you know, long COVID is still a risk, but I think it's less of a risk today than what it was in March of 2020. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, when people say, what can I do to prevent long COVID? Well, you know, be vaccinated, be boosted. And, uh, and you know, if you get infected, well, hopefully, you know, you'll start treatment. We don't know if treatment makes any difference in long COVID. I've not seen any good data suggesting that treatment makes a difference in the, in the prevalence and incidence including of long COVID. Whether, including whether you took Paxlovid? Yeah, I have not seen any evidence on, on the use of Paxlovid to prevent long COVID. And any trials but, of Paxlovid in people who, who have long COVID, not, not to prevent it, but as a treatment? I, I'm not seeing that, but again, a lot of studies are happening. You know, there's a recovered cohorts that you know, I'm sure UCSF is part of the recovery study. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I'm part of the drug subcommittee that is looking at drugs that are then gonna go into clinical trials. And I think there's a lot of good things happening in, fact, in, in long COVID clinical trials that I think will give us some answers to a lot of the questions that we have. But right and now, I think the challenge is we don't even understand the pathogenesis, right? Right, right, right. And, and when you say it's sort of a, a lower prevalence or more benign course in Omicron, is that, do we think that's a viral effect or that's an immunity effect that there are now more people who have had been vaccinated with COVID? I mean, I don't think we know. My gut feeling is that it's immunity. My uh -huh. gut feeling is that even the, 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 more, the less severe course of Omicron is immunity. I mean, I think, you know, as a virus continues happening in a population with higher levels of immunity, both natural and vaccine induced, you, you start seeing less severe disease. And we see uh -huh. that in, in, in many other infections. So I think immunity is playing more of a role in the 
in the clinical presentation and in the long-term complications than anything else. Mm -hmm. Adaptive immunity and also, I think, reduction of severity of disease because mm -hmm. it was so, so highly correlated with how severe the initial disease was. Mm -hmm. Big JAMA study um, that showed that as a meta-analysis, um, about 2.7% prevalence now um, and uh, it really decreased from much higher because of... So, so that, so, yeah, I saw that study. So when people ask you, you know, uh, you know, as I've said to many people, you know, I don't fear dying of COVID anymore. I mostly fear long COVID. And people have been citing, you know, well, there's a 10 to 20% chance you'll get long COVID. And if you're vaccinated, maybe it's lower than that. But is that what you think is the best number now? More like 3%, more like one out of 30 people will get it? That was a very recent meta-analysis um, mm -hmm. in JAMA. So they, they tried to put together all the data and really saw that the trend and decrease over time. Um, and, and so I'm at kind of 2.7% as the, as the latest number, um, but it, and it has to do, I think, right, with, with decreased severity of disease and increased adaptive immunity, reducing that kind of non-specific innate immunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's spend the last couple of minutes. Uh, I want to Oh, just one, one more long COVID question. Any, we had Dr. Alali on last uh, time we did a COVID grant. It's thinking about this other part of long COVID, which is long-term risk of heart attacks, strokes, the long-term non-infectious risk that seem to be higher in people who've had COVID than have. And any more information on, on that question, the, the not symptomatic long COVID, but does it increase your risk of long-term bad non-infectious outcomes? Nothing came up at the meeting? Yeah, not 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 much. I mean, I think we it, there was hope, you know, as as as, uh, as people will know, you know, there, we we are using anticoagulation um, for many hospitalized patients. And of course, there was some hope that maybe providing a couple of weeks of anticoagulation in the outpatient setting uh, might decrease risks. But the, the risks appear to be low enough in the short term um, uh, that, that uh, you know, that benefit doesn't outweigh risk in that setting. So we really have not, it, we really don't seem to have anything that's going to mitigate those risks, um, you know, for patients after they leave the hospital, at least not yet. Got it. Uh, monoclonals, um, current state, we keep hearing that maybe the ones that we have aren't working, including Evisheld for immunosuppressed people. Any more information about that, either for the, from the meeting or just from what you're seeing? Because uh, that's been an important part of treatment in some patients, but I think particularly in immunosuppressed patients, this whole issue of does the prophylaxis work? Well, I think, I think monoclonals uh, were useful when we had them, right? I think the challenge with monoclonals is that they're so strain-specific. I think we're still using every show, but I think we, we know that the end is near. It's coming because as, as variants have, have evolved and we're seeing some, some of the new variants that are not going to be resistant to every show. Mm -hmm. I think beptolizumab has been is the only monoclonal that we're still using right now, still working right now. We're still not using as much as we probably should, and the government is no longer buying it. I think because of the law of the rapid loss of, I mean, think about all the monoclonals we, we had came and, 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 and we no longer use them or know them. That makes it very unattractive for pharma to develop this monoclonal, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of research, a lot of money to develop them, a lot of testing. And then, you know, you use them for a very short period of time. I and mean, think about the investment in Regeneron or any of those monoclonals and then how quickly we lost them. So I, no, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody in pharma right now doing research in, in monoclonals. So I think, I think monoclonals are going to become something that we're going to say, gee, I'm glad we had them for a while, but we're no longer available. Uh, but maybe it's time to, to rethink, uh, you know, what's the role of, 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 of you know, hyperimmune, mono, uh, you know, convalescent serum and what other possibilities do we have? Because, because the directed monoclonals that were very, you know, strain specific are, are simply going way too quickly. And I love monoclonals. I thought they were great when we had them. Yeah, yeah. No, it's disappointing, but I guess that's the virus is pretty smart. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah. Oh, Bob, just very briefly, one yeah. of the things that we're going to try to uh, bring up um, here at San Francisco General, you know, just anticipating um, the demise of monoclonals is, um, you know, revitalizing uh, the pine tree study and uh, three days of uh, remdesivir for people who aren't hospitalized, um, perhaps who... Um, for whom Paxlovid may not be uh, the optimal choice. We, we don't, uh, of course, have comparative data for uh, Paxlovid versus uh, remdesivir, but the, you know, we 
as Monica pointed out, we're, we're, we're much further along in this now. So we, we can um, be creative in some ways and, um, you know, look for different thing, options. The good yeah. thing about IV remdesivir um, in the outpatient setting is it can be used for young children, mm -hmm. uh, which helps them. I, I mean, I think one of the, all the way one down of, to, to little babies. Mm -hmm. one, of the one of the things we need to remind ourselves and we need to make an effort is today in the U.S., if we have somebody hospitalized with COVID, not hospitalized and they tested positive, truly hospitalized with COVID, there's gotta be a failure there somewhere, right? They weren't vaccinated, they didn't receive appropriate therapies, and we need to see it as a failure of, 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 of public health, the healthcare system, and we need to, we should not be seeing hospitalizations, and the fact that we're still seeing them is a reflection of low levels of vaccination in our country, we're 30 something in the world in vaccination, yeah. low levels of boosting, and very low use of the drugs we have available. To me, it's very frustrating that we have this rich country with all this available resources and we're not using them. And that to me goes back to the beginning, right? This, this loss of, of trust in science. And, you know, it's, it's really depressing because it's so complicated to see what we're still seeing despite where we could be if we had used all the tools we have. Yeah, I think that's a good note, to, depressing, but, but actually quite appropriate note to end on and summarizes sort of the state of the art, amazing amount of science that we've learned in the last three years, amazing number of tools we developed. And the fact is that the, the majority of people have not gotten boosted is, is shocking. And we have to continue to try to communicate effectively. And thank you all for doing that here. And Carlos, thank you for being here. And thank you for your leadership uh, nationally on this, along with uh, my two colleagues here. It's, uh, it's, it's impressive and it's really important. And hopefully we'll keep getting the word out and, and, and working on, on uh, doing what we can to mitigate this thing. I appreciate it and uh, and everybody stay safe. Have a good week.